Welcome to Inside, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with David Bennett, Vice President of Development and Alumni Relations of Howard University. David has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, David, for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for being here at Howard. So, developing resources for a university of this history is still quite challenging. Talk about the challenges that you face in, in generating the support from diverse donors, mm -hmm. from diverse funders for this historic university. Well, it's, it's interesting. The legacy of Howard is one that's based in philanthropy. It was the Freedmen's Bureau 151 years ago and some individuals that wanted to find a way to educate black teachers and black preachers. So in one sense, philanthropy is a part of our founding story here at Howard. But over the generations, it has not been an, a regular part of our dialogue. So I look at state universities in the 70s, for example, where they were used to getting all of their funding from the state government. Is that revenue pattern changed? Universities, even the Michigans and the Wisconsins, had to learn how to talk to their alumni and talk to others about why giving is important. We're really at that stage now. Uh, we've underinvested in our campus, we've underinvested in our faculty, and this is the opportunity to maintain our excellence by telling people why we need them to come to the table with us. There was a time in Howard's history where the, the focus was on education and the idea of focusing on the, uh, the operating aspects, operating excellence, um, was seen as being in competition almost mm -hmm. with the academic side. But that act, that culture has actually shifted. So so now you're focusing simultaneously on at the academics and the and the other work that you do in the community, and the fact that you require the very best in business operations. We have to. We're at seven hundred and fifty eight hundred million dollar enterprise. We have ten and a half thousand students we're responsible for, and the faculty and staff that enable them. We need them not just to be in safe facilities, but facilities that enable their learning. Think about the studio we're in today. The students who are here learning need to be working with the kind of equipment they would see in a commercial studio space so that they can leave here with a communications degree and be workforce ready. So to separate the facilities and operations side from the actual success of the academic venture, th that's no longer the way the world works. To be workforce ready and enabled, you have to understand and have the spaces that let you do that. So talk about the extent of the operations of an almost billion dollar mm -hmm. enterprise. So we have the, the hospital, which I'll set aside for a minute because it's its own kind of kettle of fish, if you will. But the, the enterprise for us is driven primarily by tuition, but at a much smaller percentage than most universities, um, by a federal appropriation that we receive that supports the work that we do, and in a very small way, historically, from philanthropy. So what we're trying to do is grow the philanthropy piece of that faster than we would ever want to grow the tuition piece. Right. We, 60% of our undergraduate students are Pell Grant eligible, which is a proxy for financial need. If you look at our competing private universities in Washington, they're 11%, 12%, and 14%. At the same time, our tuition is about half of theirs. So we're underwriting far more student financial need here, and we're okay with that. That is part of Howard's legacy, is making school affordable and available to people. But we still know that that $24,000 tuition is a lot for our students. So growing philanthropy means that we can look to other forms of revenue rather than going to our students and saying, you need to pay 10%, 20%, 30% more. And in, in effect, Howard's mission, if you, take, if you strip down all the language, Howard's mission really comes down to creating a step change for the students and the community of Howard. And we talk a lot about the, the phrase excellence and truth and service. And the service is core to who we are. And a Howard woman or a Howard man at the table, at the boardroom, in the surgical theater, in the animation studio, creates more pathways for the story of the shared African diaspora and our experience to, to generate a ripple effect. We have more people in more places, better trained and more committed to a socially just world. It absolutely is critical for us that, that it's not just about being workforce ready, but it's about uh, being willing to fight for a more just and more inclusive America and increasingly world. How do you take the brand and position that brand in an appropriate way so that it, it is elevated in the minds of not only alumni, but, on, but of others in the community, of the African American mm -hmm. communities and also just uh, citizens of, of the United States 
who are willing to support and are interested in supporting a, a university of Howard's uh, stature, but have so many choices that mm -hmm. they can make. It's how, do you, a, how do you use that? It's actually, it's a fascinating challenge that we're just starting to understand. We have spent so long talking to our own community, our own alumni, our own faculty, the African-American population in the United States, which has always seen Howard as an important contributor to justice in, in the public dialogue. We read about in the paper about job pipelines and the lack of women, the lack of people of color in professional settings. Well, Howard graduates more black physicians and more black dentists than any other institution in America. And more students who are applying to medical schools across America who are African American students graduated from Howard than any other place. We graduated more black PhDs in the STEM field in a 10 year period, according to the National Science Foundation, than did Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and Yale combined. So when we talk about the contemporary problems business leaders and social leaders are doing, are trying to address, Howard is a solution and has been a solution for a long time. We think that we are kind of central to a dialogue in Washington about what full participation is, but also as we look at, again, opening the doors for more people uh, to achieve full participation in society, we're catalytic and we have been for 150 years. That's just to your point, the story that we need to be telling to more people outside our kind of typical audience. So in terms of comparative advantage of a contributed dollar, your story, the story that you can tell, is that if you really want to create a more just society in America, think about the fact that if you have a university that is graduating so many leaders in mm -hmm. diverse fields, where do, you, where, do you, um, where do you invest? Do you invest right. in a place that is demonstratively the leader right. and is driving further, or do you, do you make another investment where perhaps that, that investment in, in that future is, is, is diluted by other purpose? And, and that's, it, to me, it's the case for finding the right investor who answers the question right. the way you phrase it. So if I want to generate more physicists, there might be many schools that I can go to. If I want to efficiently increase the diversification of physics practice in America, if I want to diversify the academy, your dollar goes a lot further here when I have more African-American men studying physics at Howard than any other institution in America. That our ability to help those students graduate in four years, not have to leave because of financial pressures, even a postdocs for those students. We can literally provide the most talented students in America who also happen to address these issues of pipeline and equity and full inclusion. If I spend the same dollar in another institution in town, I'm sure they share our commitment, but they don't share our track record. If I write you a check for a million dollars today and I just say, spend it the way you see fit, how does that pie get sliced? I would put it in two ways. The first is financial support for students. So we put a hundred- The first is financial first support. Is, absolutely. So the first is the student need. Absolutely. That, that we have, we put $110 million last year into student financial aid, either in direct payment or discounting the tuition that we say we charge. It's one of the largest single lines in our budget and it's the one that makes the biggest difference for our students. So one of the buckets I would look at would be student financial need today. That's 12 or 13% of your budget. It's huge. It's, but it's, again, we could charge more tuition and we have the applicant pool. I think last year we rejected nine applicants for every one we accepted. We could choose to have need as a factor in our admissions policy, but historically we haven't. We've chosen the students who can best benefit from the Howard education. So the short term helping today's student is one. The second term is we have a $750 million endowment, which is far more than any other historically black college. That said, the interest on Howard's in, at Harvard's endowment this year could run Howard for two and a half years. So growing that endowment to be able to provide financial aid and faculty support tomorrow would be a second priority. The third thing though is, and you spoke to it, is facilities. And my president is very clear that we don't build rock climbing walls. We're not gonna compete with those <laughs> universities that are opening $30 million football locker rooms. I wish we could, but our priorities and our needs are different than that. But 
we've restored 65% of our dorm rooms or built new in the last five years. 65% of your dorm rooms. All of our dorm rooms are either new or renovated. Which deals with the affordable housing issue Correct. for students uh, on campus. Correct, we, we don't have the level of faculty housing that we need. So you have a young assistant professor, she may have a husband or a partner, she may have kids. Are you driving in from Largo every day? because you can't afford to live in the Shaw neighborhood anymore, addressing issues like that. But you know, the School of Communications is a perfect example of, we have an amazing program, but the facilities don't allow us to let our students learn on the green screens and using today's technology to, to tell stories the way that are happening in, in every YouTube studio around America. So those facilities that directly tie to education are critical as well. So you don't want the, to use the day before yesterday's technologies to tell the stories of tomorrow. Correct, because how do I then go with a straight face and tell employers these are not just the best young women and men in America, but they're ready to go to work on day one. We've had a couple of employers tell us that regardless of how good a school students come from, most businesses spend two years training them to be employees because they come from such an academic environment that didn't have the engagement to the real world. Well, we have a new program we today launched, it's expansion with Google, where we're gonna send 120 of our students to Google for a semester and have them co-taught by Google faculty and our faculty. What that means is they're working in a real world environment. Their projects are directly tied to what they would be working on when Google hires them. And our faculty is coming back and changing the curriculum. Which changing the curriculum at a university, it's an act of God. Except when our faculty go out and say, I know how to better prepare my students to work. So would you rather your, your machine learning curriculum be taught by somebody who had been working in a classroom for 40 years, or who just was at Google for a year learning how to, to teach and instruct. It's, it's part of the whole mix, so it's, it's not one piece of facility or long-term dollars or short-term dollars. It's how do we leverage them all together to prepare our students and our faculty for, for what comes next. So you're talking constantly about the community. Instead of, uh, instead of talking about the, the next grand building with the with the new right. name on it and and you're making some hard decisions maybe the the uh, next investment is a very practical investment that goes back always to your core mission right and 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 that's the sensibility that this university brings to development we have to one because we don't have the luxury of more dollars than we know how to spend like some of our Ivy League colleagues have but also because we are robustly mission driven we are about creating people who are better equipped to have conversations and have leadership roles in making this a more just world and a more equal world. And it's, it sounds simple, but if that's your animating principle, it's not that hard to make business decisions that come from it. And we, it's one of the great things that universities do is debate who's at the center. Well, is it students? Is it the faculty? Is it staff? No, it's, it's the mission. Why we're here is creating those scholars and leaders of tomorrow, all of our decisions go through that filter. David Bennett, thank you so much for sharing the future of Howard University with us. Thank you so much for sharing how you will help to deliver the future with the president of the university and with all the wonderful people of Howard, all the wonderful alumni of Howard. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.